I have rewritten this script so many times. Hello, and welcome back to the Bird Channel, where we talk about whatever I want and I stream on twitch.tv slash Jinzy. If you like this video, consider liking it in a very literal sense and leaving a comment about something or the other, because otherwise YouTube will confiscate your pets. Save your pets! Leave a comment. If you don't have any pets, YouTube will provide one, implant false memories of how much you love this pet, and then take it away. Today, we're going to talk about Onimusha, but we're doing so in one large video because, let's be honest, most people don't watch a part two of anything and then wonder where all the missing information is. Looking at you, Gontro Dim Two-Parter. The last installment of Onimusha, if we can call it that, was a remaster of Onimusha Warlords in 2019 for PC. So what happened to Onimusha? Why did it disappear? And how about that Japanese history? Yes, I'm going to give you some Japanese history because I think it's interesting and it is relevant to the topic at hand, to a point. So, gather round the fire and let me tell you a tale. Let's start with what the games are first. Largely, they're a hack and slash type action adventure game. At least, the main series is. More on that later. Long, long ago, that is to say 1997, in a studio far away, Resident Evil was a massive hit with the gamers. Capcom saw that success and one particular individual, Yoshiki Okamoto, sought to adapt this success to feudal Japan. Specifically, the Sengoku period. Thus, Sengoku Biohazard was born. Biohazard was the Japanese name for a Resident Evil, and this new game would follow the same principle. Instead of a mansion, we'd enter a house filled with ninja traps. The project was set to be released on the Nintendo 64 DD, that being an extension for the Nintendo 64 that allowed the use of floppy disks, and it could even connect to their own online service, RantNet, allowing Nintendo users to game online all the way back in 1999. Don't be alarmed if you haven't heard of this gadget before. It was exclusive to Japan and only had 10 releases total before being discontinued, and Onimusha was not one of them. Instead, the project was moved to the PlayStation 1, and they'd gotten about 50% of the way there when the whole world started salivating over the PlayStation 2, and the team was moved once again to work on a version for this new and exciting console. And I would like to say it's well worth it. Onimusha Warlords was the final product, and while it didn't take full advantage of the PlayStation 2's capabilities, given its release relatively shortly after the console's launch, it still looked incredibly good. The few full motion video cutscenes we have, while not perfect, set the atmosphere of the game perfectly. The pre-rendered backgrounds are vibrant and detailed, and I cannot tell you how happy I am to see colors that are not all grey and brown. Uh, John, we need a horror game setting. Grey! No, there's a lot of grey in the last game already. We need something fresh. Brown! John, if we make the whole game brown, it will literally look like shit. Fair point. <sighs> grey and brown. John, no, we can't do that either. Why not? Most shooters get away with it. You know what? Fair point. Uh, grey and brown it is. <laughs> and to avoid repeating the same information twice, most of the mainline Onimusha games use roughly the same systems. You are an Oni warrior, a warrior chosen by the Oni to fight against the encroaching Genma threat. Genma are demons, undead, all sorts really. The point is they like to eat humans, drink blood, and something about livers. Oh, a liver! The Oni warrior either has a bloodline that can be traced back to the Oni themselves, or they're given an Oni gauntlet. Through either means they can absorb the souls of the Genma they slay, and in turn, these souls will upgrade their weapons, armor, or other items you can use as you hack and slash your way through the game. Their arsenal includes the mundane, like bows and guns, but also magical weaponry that can be used to fire off ridiculously powerful magic attacks. And if you're very good at the game, you could even master the Isen Critical, a mainstay that I never got very good at, but it's basically a perfect counterattack that kills most enemies in one hit. Throughout the games, you'll find puzzle boxes of various kinds, such as the demonic get all the numbers in a row, or the downright evil sliding tile puzzles, and occasionally... math. Don't worry, the math was so easy even I could figure it out. Every Onimusha game also has a Phantom Realm, or a Dark Realm. They go by many names, but I'll use Dark Realm for consistency. A bonus zone where you can grind souls to your heart's content while fighting ever more difficult waves of enemies, and by the end you are rewarded with a powerful or otherwise unique item. Not all Dark Realms are created equally. More on that later. Also present in every Onimusha game bar one is the main antagonist, the horrible evil Oda Nobunaga. 
The first game takes place during Oda Nobunaga's rise to power. It was a good idea to use Nobunaga's story as something of a red threat, not just because he gained the nickname Demon King in real life too, but also because he had a very interesting life and was a bit of a controversial character. This is where the Japanese history comes in. Don't worry, I'll keep it short. This part of the script used to be several pages long. Sorry, I promise this is relevant and interesting. When Nobunaga was but a wee lad, he was not very well respected on account of his blatant disregard for proper etiquette, which included hanging out with peasants. When his father eventually died, Nobunaga threw ceremonial incense at the altar during the funeral, causing one of his mentors to perform seppuku in hopes it would shock some sense into the boy. Many betrayals and other shenanigans later, some sense was in fact knocked into the boy, but it was a little late because by this point the Oda clan was seen as rather weak. So much so that one of their rivals, the Imagawa clan, decided to do a little bit of conquering. They won victory after easy victory and marched laughing into Oda territory. If you're wondering about the score here, Imagawa Yoshimoto reportedly commanded 25,000 warriors against Oda Nobunaga's 2,500. 10 to 1. Not the best odds. Nobunaga's advisors therefore told him to please run away very quickly, but Nobunaga was having none of that. He was quoted to have said, We were born in order to die. Whoever is with me, come to the battlefield tomorrow morning. Whoever is not, just stay wherever you are and watch me win it. He set up a counterattack, wolfed down some rice porridge in the morning, quoted one of his favorite songs, and off he went. He'd used a smaller part of his army to set up a distraction. They'd wave every banner under the sun while the bulk of his army circled around and flanked the Imagawa encampment. And I would not be telling you this story right now if Nobunaga didn't win overwhelmingly. Which he did. A recent thunderstorm perfectly masked his approach, and the Imagawa army was completely unprepared for the attack at all. This made Nobunaga a very popular guy all of a sudden, and plenty new generals, lords, and samurai flocked to his banner. He performed many a great feat during his time, but we'd be here all day if we had to talk about them all, so we'll get back to this. I think from this you can understand why they made Nobunaga the main antagonist of this entire series. He was known both as an evil man and as a great leader. In Onimusha Warlords, we open on that fateful first big battle, the Battle of Okehazama. Unlike the real world, Nobunaga gets shot in the throat this time and dies, only to be revived by the Genma. His objective now becomes finding Princess Yuki of the Saito clan and drinking her blood directly out of her skull in order to complete his bond with his new Genma overlords. That's where the protagonist, Samanosuke, comes in. It's up to him and his trusty side ninja, Kaede, to save Princess Yuki and defeat Nobunaga and his trusty side person, Tokichiro. Samanosuke initially finds Yuki almost immediately, but is knocked out by a Genma general and awoken by the Oni spirits who bestow upon him his Oni gauntlet. Samanosuke. Samanosuke. Wake up, Samanosuke. So, fortune has smiled upon me this day. With the power of this gauntlet, I will destroy all of those monsters and save the princess. A gauntlet in hand, or on hand, whichever, we enter Inabayama Castle, the Saito Keep, to find Yuki once more. We run into various interesting Genma individuals on the way, most importantly, Gildenstern. Mm, what's this? So but also Yume Maru, a young child Yuki has adopted as her brother. Tokichiro makes several attempts to kidnap him, but we manage to keep him safe long enough for Samanosuke to sit him down in the middle of a Genma-infested keep so he can have a fatherly speech about the meaning of life for a hot minute. In this world, you only must help to understand the absurdity Four years of fighting ago, my uncle was a small portion of land on this tiny island. The Princess Yuki is underground. Oh. In general, the story is very much in service of the gameplay. I enjoy it, but it's a case of running into Tokichiro, him trying to persuade us to join Nobunaga, us declining, and then more kidnapping ensues. That's not to say the world isn't story rich, however. You can find notes explaining details about the Genma world and its rituals. The majority of which seem to be written by Gildenstern himself, who does not have a very high opinion of humans. They unfortunately also drag in the a wizard did it school of world building, except this time a Genma did it. Genghis Khan? Alexander the Great? Impressive generals? 
Maybe, but actually they made a pact with the Genma for their technology so they could conquer the world. Which is odd, because I feel like we would have known by now if the great generals of the past all partook in massive human sacrifice rituals. I've never been a fan of this type of writing, and I'm very glad it doesn't feature prominently in the game. I also feel a lot of the notes were created without keeping the story of the future in mind, because there are various bits of information that contradict later games. In this game, it's said that the Genma King was born from the chaos of the Earth's creation and dwells in the deepest and darkest place underground. All Genma are born of the Genma King, and no one disobeys him. A very simple concept in itself. Hilariously, one of the entries also mentions that he only shows himself during the dark ceremony, and no one knows what he does otherwise, which I'm sure they didn't mean in a comedic way, but that is how I chose to read it. <laughs> oh, you silly kitty. Oh, what a silly kitty you are. Oh, that's, that's some good tea. Dear diary, the only king still won't come to my birthday party. I asked him at least twice, feeling a little deflated. In later games, it is revealed that he's actually the god of light, who was eventually locked in a star by the Oni, but revived somehow in Warlords, in a weakened state. Which is the only reason we managed to defeat him at all, killing him and leaving a power vacuum in the Genma ranks. But wait, no, in the final Onimusha game, his soul is stuck in the star again. What I'm trying to say is, please only pay very loose attention to the finer details of Genma and Oni lore. Do not give yourself the headache. Within the games themselves, the lore is of course consistent enough, but the jump from game to game almost always leaves gaps. I will absolutely bring this up again when we get to the spin-off games. Warlords, after a bunch more saving and kidnapping, eventually gets to a point where Tokichiro begins the dark ritual to open the evil gate to the Genma world, and we find our way inside to save Yumimaru and Yuki. This is where we finally meet the Genma King, Fortinbra. like the presentation of this boss. He looks imposing and genuinely scary, especially before he opens his wings. It's a pity his boss fight is not particularly difficult, especially if you've picked up the ultimate weapon earlier, but his entrance is spectacular. After defeating him, we try to make our escape, but the king awakens once more to grab Samonosuke and squeeze him to death, causing blood to fall onto his Oni gauntlet and turning our protagonist into the Onimusha. Literally, the Oni warrior. I know the translation doesn't sound nearly as cool, sorry. As our allies flee, we stab Fortinbra to death for real, Nobunaga shows up looking very annoyed, and the game ends. There isn't really an animated ending cutscene in this case, it's mostly slides. Nobunaga takes over Inabayama a castle and renames it Gifu Castle, just like in the real world. Yuki and Yumemaru go traveling, Kaide looks for Samonosuke but fails and dies in a later war, and the only animated scene we get is one of Samonosuke overlooking the valley. So he is still alive, he just doesn't want to hang out with Kaide anymore. Poor Kaide gets the short end of the stick a lot of times. You get to control her during several parts of the game, and her combat skills are quick and easy to use. She even finds a weapon that does proper damage against the Genma, but she doesn't have magic at her disposal, so no matter what, she'll feel a little weaker than Samonosuke. And her only non-combat segment is a small puzzle bit with time pressure. Not usually my favorite part of a game. She also suffers from being a side character in a game scarce in character development at the best of times. Generally, she'll show up, say the thing that will ensure Samonosuke can progress, and then leave. The most egregious scene is the evil gate. When Yumemaru is dragged through the evil gate, Kaide finds us there to say, what's that? Then she throws something at the barrier and leaves because she should split up without telling Samonosuke what she meant to tell him. Because this takes place fairly shortly after her playable segment. Here's how that segment ends. Do not give up, your highness. I will save you. No, you won't. <gasps> what? <laughs> you can die here in love. Princess Yuki! Princess Yuki! Have to tell him! And here's what happens when she finds Samanosuke. Samanosuke, what is this? Ha! We have. 
have to destroy that stone. Let's separate and find a way. Fine. What happened to telling Samonosuke about Princess Yuki? Did you forget? Were there more pressing matters at hand? She didn't even wait for Samonosuke to explain what this is, even though she asked. It feels like certain things involving her were afterthoughts, or perhaps part of the story was cut for time. And then we hear she died a few years later, having never found Samonosuke. In true old game style, her backstory is also only found in the original game manual. I did say the story was largely in service of the gameplay though, so it's not entirely surprising. And the gameplay is very satisfying. Every mainline Onimusha game is a hack and slash variant. The combat is fast and fluent, you never really feel like your character is sluggish or unresponsive, and the magic attacks are very rewarding to use. Not least of all because they're so ridiculously powerful. Each weapon has their own bar of magic, which means you can walk into a boss fight with full mana bars, spam the first weapon's magic attack, then switch to the next weapon and repeat. There were bosses that died almost entirely due to the initial magic attack spam. Honestly, if you're looking for a good entry point to hack and slash games with a horror element, this is an excellent choice, especially because it also doesn't overstay its welcome. I faffed about quite a bit with puzzle boxes and dark realms while recording gameplay for this video, and I still managed to finish the game in a little over three hours. If you want a little extra gameplay, however, you can also try your hand at the Oni Spirit minigame. You unlock this little side mode by collecting all 20 fluorites in the game. These are invisible items that you can eventually turn visible scattered all over the game. In the spirit of Resident Evil, collecting 10 of these items also unlocks a special costume for Samonosuke, which is very worthwhile if I do say so myself. And you're sure this is going to make me intimidating, hmm? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's all the rage. I suppose this is technically a predator. Mm-hmm. I guess I just feel like armor would be more appropriate. Well, you won't have to fight if they run for the hills at the sight of you. Yes, I suppose that's true. I'll take it. The Oni Spirit minigame is a reasonably tough challenge that sees you race against time to break free the souls stuck in pots. And if you do beat every level, you unlock ultimate mode which is not an extremely difficult mode, as you might expect. Instead, it's the easiest mode in the game. It starts you off with the game's ultimate weapon, the Bishamon Sword, as well as unlimited ammo and mana. Very cool, of course, but the panda suit is the real reward here, let's not forget. Although ultimate mode does make it easier to unlock S-Rank, which in turn unlocks the extra costume for Kaide, which is also interesting. If you are looking for a bit more of a challenge, though, you could try the Onimusha Warlords remake, or side version, or whatever you want to call it, Genma Onimusha. This game was released on the Xbox only, and to this day has not seen the light of day on any other platform. In essence, it's still Warlords, but there are far more enemies, positions have changed all over the place, and everyone hits like a truck. The game also starts with some of the late game enemies present from the very beginning. On top of that, they've added their own version of Devil May Cry's Devil Trigger. A green orb shows up every so often among all the other orbs, and if you absorb enough of them, you can use your own invulnerability. The trouble here is that enemies can fight you over these orbs, and if they win, they gain attack power and speed. As if that wasn't enough, they also added a haunted doll called Ayame, who finds you at the most inopportune moments and also hits like a truck. She can only be killed by magic, so if you have none, you're going to have a bad time. If you've ever played Silent Hill 4, The Room, she's a bit like the ghosts. The story otherwise is the same as the original game. They added another Dark Realm type zone called the Ogre Tower, alongside several new pieces of armor and the ability to charge up your attacks. You can even cut off limbs as a treat. Think of it as a spruced up new game plus. If you're looking for a challenge and you like Onimusha games, this might be a good option. Although, as said, it only ever got a release on the Xbox, so you're going to have to find alternative means to play the game? Emulation. I mean, you have to use an emulator. I really do think Onimusha Warlords is still worth giving a go for yourself. The remaster is available on Steam and on sale pretty often. I picked it up for 80 euros at the time. So if you're in the mood for a comfortable hack and slash set in Sengoku, Japan with Resident Evil influences, Onimusha Warlords for your consideration. Although I would add the recommendation to play with Japanese voiceover. The English voice actors are doing the very best they can with the material, but it's just not really working for anyone involved. 
Samanosuke, defeat and seal their souls to your right hand. Except Guildenstern, he's doing great. And you'll be pleased to hear that Onimusha Warlords sold exceptionally well. It became the PlayStation 2's first game to sell over a million copies, more than enough to attempt a part two. Especially since Onimusha was always planned as a trilogy and Warlords included a teaser trailer for the second game. A bit premature, perhaps, but you've got to admire their confidence. Not a surprise, then, that the second installment, Onimusha 2, Samurai's Destiny, released a little over a year after the first game. It had actually been in production alongside Warlords and, as such, was also meant for the PlayStation 1 initially. And while I still love how both the first and second game look, neither really took advantage of the PlayStation 2's graphical power. Still, that doesn't mean it's a carbon copy of the first game. The main game mechanics didn't change, but they did add some interesting new features. Most importantly, allies. And this fancy intro music video, if you linger on the starting screen too long, big fan. I unironically love this. It takes me back to the Naruto AMVs of the past set to let the bodies hit the floor. Our protagonist this time is not Samanosuke, but Jubei Yagyu, one of Japan's most famous swordsmen. But he's not alone, technically. Very early into the game, you meet with several other characters. In fact, you meet all of them almost immediately upon visiting the First Zone's village. They don't travel with you per se, but they do show up from time to time to give you a hand, especially if you give them gifts. That's the important companion mechanic. Every so often, you'll find or buy items that one of your allies might like. One of them likes alcohol, another books, or travel-related things. If you give them those items, they will like you better and give you an item in return. Depending on who likes you the most over the course of the game, your cutscenes will change and you'll learn more about them as a person. During my first playthrough, I gave most of my gifts to the hot-headed, mysterious gunman Magoichi. When you first meet him, he keeps to himself and reacts in a rude manner 9 out of 10 times. He seems to only care about money and aggressively not helping anyone but himself. After a little while of gift-giving, however, we get a cutscene with Tokichiro. Yes, he's in the game again. Goading us on to fight because Magoichi was willing to take money from Nobunaga. Later down the line, Magoichi explains that, yes, he is willing to take Nobunaga's money, but only because that's his way of fighting back against him. He wanted to deplete Nobunaga's funds and supplies. He's well aware that his village is next on Nobunaga's hit list, and this is all he can do to protect them. Near the end of the game, if you've befriended him for real, he even shows up to blast the boss just before Nobunaga into the next life, before he takes off back to his village and invites us to join him there when all this was over. It's a nice little side story to follow. Hey, got you this nice plant. Oh, nice. I love plants. I still don't like you, though. Uh, cool. No worries. I also got you this cat. What? That's my favorite thing. How did you know? I guess I like you now. Well, how about I give you this large pack of instant noodles? Okay, you got me. I love you. Great. I enjoy making new friends. Just tell me who to kill and I'll murder them on sight. What? My gift to you is blood. The gifts you can give your allies are also limited, so while you can become moderately good friends with all of them over the course of a single playthrough, it's much more beneficial and interesting to only give your gifts to a single character at a time. Not doing so means you'll generally miss bits and pieces of their story, and it's an overall worse experience. Some characters also don't give you all of their story unless you actively refuse to befriend them. Okay, the spearman will betray you near the end of the game, joining Nobunaga, if you didn't feed him his daily alcohol. On the other hand, if you don't give Oyu, the love interest character, enough gifts, then she and Jubei will not kiss during their final meeting. This system gives the game a lot of replayability, and some of the gifts have interesting little quirks as well. In the game's first zone, a small mining village, there's a vendor who changes his stock three times total. One of the items he sells is a regular egg. You can give that egg to an ally immediately, or if you keep it in your inventory long enough, it will eventually hatch into a chick which turns into a chicken who lays a brown egg that hatches a brown chick and becomes a brown chicken who lays a gold egg hatching into a gold chick and growing into a gold chicken. The final form granting far more friendship points than any of the other versions. Depending on when and where you give out certain items, your allies can also have different reactions and some sections of the game allow you to play as them. In fact, some lockboxes can only be opened by specific allies. What I'm saying is, I really like the ally system and I wish it had stuck around for future games. 
This game also incorporates the Devil Trigger mechanic from Genma Onimusha from the get-go, this time activated by collecting purple orbs. In this case, it gives us our Onimusha form, which grants you greater damage and invulnerability. This makes for a pleasant little safeguard, and it feels very satisfying to completely destroy your enemies for a short while, especially if they just killed you. These are all additions I like in this game, but unfortunately I do have a bone to pick with another system added this time around. The regeneration items. This is by far not the only game with a mechanic of this kind, but once you know it's there, you can't ignore it as much as you wish you could. You can find a necklace in the game that regenerates your health as long as you're standing still, doing nothing. Healing items are limited in this game, and this necklace means you'll very rarely have to use any at all. However, you have to stand still doing nothing a lot. My first run through of this game took me nearly nine and a half hours, and I guarantee that at least half an hour of that time was spent by me standing still and leaving my computer for a moment for a drink while Jubei got his health back. I know there are people who will argue that you can just opt to not use the item, and you're correct. However, it is in the game. It exists and begs to be used. Completely ignoring an item purposefully put into the game doesn't feel good. It's free healing, it's just also very boring. This particular necklace can only be obtained by buying out the shop in the first village three times in a row, so I'm sure there are plenty of people who might miss it altogether. But if you're a bit of a completionist like me, you will see a shop with permanent buyouts like a challenge like a check mark waiting to be checked. I don't like this system, is what I'm saying. Especially because this addition persists in future games and it gets worse. In this game, the item doesn't work in the Dark Realm at least, which means that part of the game is still relatively challenging. When it comes down to it, this is a minor pet peeve, but I'd be remiss not to at least mention it. You'll be glad to know I enjoyed the story very much. Samurai's Destiny opens with the most mellow narrator in the history of the world. Soon after his victory, Nobunaga fell to a fatal arrow which pierced his throat. He recaps the events of the first game and we see a village getting attacked and burned to the ground. Jubei Agyu, our hero, meanwhile rushes to his village to find it in ruins also. The Genma attacked and now a ghostly voice beckons him to the nearby shrine where he finds his mother, an Oni woman and currently his quest giver. To stop the Genma this time we must collect five sacred orbs and defeat Nobunaga. Jubei himself is half Oni and so does not need the Oni gauntlet to absorb souls. It's already in his blood. Thus, we set off to collect weapons, allies and orbs. Our allies in battle will be Oyu, which is an alias. In truth, she is Oda Uichi, Nobunaga's sister, traveling under the name Oyu because she intends to kill her brother. There is also Eke, a master of the spear, and previously in service of what was likely the Saito clan. He had lost his family in a fire and is now in search of a way to become a feudal lord. Eke often butts heads with Magoichi, master of the gun, and another ally. He pretends not to care about anyone but himself, but really he's there to get to Nobunaga as well, in an attempt to defend the village that took care of him as a child. Finally, there's Kotaro, young chief of the Fuma Ninja clan. Here to do some soul searching, he doesn't really have a story arc per se, save that he doesn't trust Oyu and is a ninja. And if you befriend him, he eventually trusts Oyu and then he immediately dies. Together we go around fighting Genma and collecting sacred orbs. And this particular game goes very off the wall when it comes to what the Oni were all about, I'll be honest. The sacred orbs were said to exist to protect humanity, but I have to ask how they envisioned that happening. Happening. The second orb was held by Oyu, and upon taking it, we put it in a conveniently available steel ball. Where did this come from? Why is it here? No one knows, but when you put the orb in, it turns into a horse, which we ride back to the village, and the horse is subsequently never heard from again. Jubei! What an extremely convenient horse! I know. With a horse like this, we could traverse long distances with ease. A metal horse will never grow tired, and it can jump the highest of walls. Although I do hope it wasn't programmed to simply run to this town and sit in the stables until the last star in the universe dies. That would be ridiculous. This village probably didn't even exist during the time of the Oni. You're right, Oyu. That would be ridiculous. Shark suit levels of ridiculous. Let us never speak of the horse again. Agreed! The first orb has a much more boring use, too. You use it to open a wall in the mine in a random village. Did the Oni foresee this? 
They made it a mine and put a little orb slot in it. And how was it saving humanity? And what was the actual purpose of the horse in Gifu Castle? How was that one saving humanity? The third orb is used to activate a metal swordfish that almost kills a person in order to get to the Oni sacred place. That one I can kind of see, because this place is important. The fourth orb activates a giant flying ship in the shape of a tortoise, and that one's very neat. But then the fifth orb activates an elevator in Gifu Castle that takes you to Nobunaga. Did the Oni build this, might I add, freshly crafted Genma Tower in Gifu Castle and then added an orb elevator slot for a good measure? Remember when I said the story was in service of the gameplay? <laughs> I really do mean it. The five orbs combined eventually allow Jubei to activate his true Onimusha form, so perhaps that was supposed to save humanity. Not sure why they needed the swordfish in that case. When it comes down to it, while I enjoy all the Onimusha games for their story bits as well, I think most longtime viewers have already noticed that I'm not doing my usual beat-by-beat -beat retelling of the story, like I did in the Shadow Hearts videos, for example. That's not because I don't like the story in Onimusha, but I also don't take it very seriously. The story is meant to be lighthearted fun, a reason for your character to go to the places he goes, do the things he does. And by the end we can punch Nobunaga in the throat. Everyone's happy. Something I would consider a story adjacent at the very least though are the character personalities. The allies are fun and interesting of course, but in this case I'm also talking about the bosses. I really like that they added bosses with personalities in this installment. Warlords didn't really have any. The only one that came close was Osric, the first boss who dies when you look at him too sternly. The second boss is Marcellus who has an interesting backstory if you care to look into it, but he doesn't talk. Then Stylado, a shadow clone of yourself who also doesn't talk. The only boss you actually fight that has any lines really is Hecuba, the big bug lady who doesn't live long enough. And of course, the final boss, Fortimbra, barely gets a word in edgewise before keeling over. In Onimusha 2, we are first introduced to Gingamfats, and he's one of those guys who doesn't know when to stop. He's very clearly very sure of himself and comes back twice after his first battle, eager to prove himself because we keep defeating him and he's even telling off other bosses from fighting us because he wants to have a go himself. And the other bosses seem to realize he's a bit of a loser. He's a little sad, but also fun. Next, we meet Juju Dorma with her Nobunaga obsession. She writes entire chapters about how much she loves him in her... Um, her, um, man, I really don't want to demonetize another video. Her dungeon? Imagine what the prefix is yourself? She's extremely flirty and haughty and very satisfying to finally kill. And these two bosses give you a reason to want them dead as well. Remember when I told you Kotaro dies if you become best friends with him? Gingamfats is the one who ends up killing the lad. Juju Dorma kills your mother. And the last boss the game introduces outside of Nobunaga is the polar opposite. Gogandantis is a demonic master swordsman. Specified, but I like to think this character is a small nod to Dante from Devil May Cry, especially because Jubei takes to shortening his name to Dantes. He's not interested in just killing us, he wants to have a good fight. The first time we meet him, we are no match for him, nor are we the second time. Each encounter he could have followed through and lopped our head off, but he doesn't because he wants to see if we might win next time. And when we do fight him for the third and final time, it's just after he saved Oyu from falling to her death. He's an honorable lad who even holds the orb that represents honor. In general, Onimusha 2 seems to be more character driven than plot driven. They really want us to get to know the enemies and allies we surround ourselves with, and it makes everything feel a lot more personal. Yeah, Yes, even when the story makes no sense otherwise. That story takes us through several new zones, but also back to Gifu Castle, which, much like the real world's history, now serves as Nobunaga's base of operation. There were murmurings on some of the old forums that it was a bit lazy to reuse Gifu Castle so much, but again, it makes sense story-wise and it's a great looking set piece. Not to mention that changes and new additions were made to the castle. The pre-rendered backgrounds also stuck around for the new zones, and while there are quite a few very regular looking forests and cave walls, you can tell they had a lot of fun with some of the other rooms. Jujudorma's boss room in particular is filled with character. 
both in her entry hall and the room itself. There's also a place called the Oni Sacred Place, which is an island with hidden Oni technology. The insides have a very factory-like feel, which makes sense when you find out that this is where they built a gigantic tortoise-shaped flying ship. But it also sports several fascinating-looking statues and water features. There's an air of mystery about it that you never really get the full story on. There aren't even many notes available to learn about the Oni, and I think that's for the best. Let them stay in the shadows. The less we know, the better. Eventually, we make it to Nobunaga, as usual, while getting bothered by Tokichiro on the way there. This was the most difficult Nobunaga fight in all of the games, as far as I'm concerned, because he's incredibly annoying. He's transferred his power into the Golden Evil statue. Yes, that's its real name. So now he becomes a much bigger, flying Genma lad. I hate when they fly. As you might have guessed, that means he's not always in reach for your attacks, and he spams his own combos readily, attacks that you have to actively run away from from because they do a lot of damage. I cannot overstate how much of a pain in the cactus this guy is. And that's just his first phase. He has another one. You will die. Next, we get to fight his entire Golden Evil statue. And if you die during this phase, you'll have to do the first phase all over again. But thankfully, the second phase is mostly a war of attrition. Jubei gains his true Onimusha form, which allows you to fire your lasers, and the goal is to destroy every part of the statue until it keels over, while dodging earth spikes, lasers, and masks. The masks are the worst part because it's not entirely clear on sight how they work. Everything else is very obviously telegraphed. It doesn't feel very heroic, though, I'll say that, given that you spend most of the fight running away from a big stumpy statue? When you defeat him, he yells he'll rise again. We run away heroically, but further away this time, and the credits roll. It's the weirdest, most non-committal ending scene I've ever seen. After the credits, we see Jubei longingly looking out to Oyu's castle, forever apart, until a crow flies into the camera with a surprisingly vocal evil laugh. <laughs> And if you thought they weren't sure about that trilogy, think again. This game also comes with a trailer for Onimusha 3. A very short intro of Samonosuke Akechi grabbing the ultimate weapon, the Bishamon Sword, and a coming soon text. I enjoyed this game a lot, even though the ending felt a little weird because of its wild replayability and interesting characters. Warlords was a wonderful setup, but it focused very clearly on giving you a reason to go places and fight monsters. While Samurai's Destiny does so as well, it makes sure to go beyond hey, someone's kidnapped, do something about it, for every story beat. I enjoyed piecing together the stories of our allies, and the gift system was an interesting addition. The third Onimusha would unfortunately drop all of that, but before we get to that, there are spin-offs to be had, starting with... <sighs> Onimusha Tactics. Onimusha Tactics is a spin-off from the Onimusha main series that I'm fairly certain isn't part of the canon for various reasons, but I'm still going to talk about it a little bit because it's definitely interesting. I don't necessarily mean that as a compliment. While researching the script, I couldn't find a whole lot about the game's development. No sporadic developer comments, nothing. So the only thing I can tell you with certainty is that two Onimusha games released that same year of 2003. Tactics and Blade Warriors, and Blade Warriors seemed to be the favorite child. There's a lot about tactics that seems rushed, things that seem to imply they were somewhat pressed for time while making this game, which is why I don't want to spend too much time talking about it. For those unfamiliar with the genre, this is a tactical role-playing game. You create a team of several characters that you put on the board and move around like chess pieces trying to murderize your enemy. The most well-known one to the general public is likely Final Fantasy Tactics. As luck would have it, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance released five months prior to Onimusha Tactics, and Onimusha was not going to win that war, so I have no idea what genius in the marketing department thought that was a good idea. Let's start at the beginning. Onimusha Tactics opens haphazardly, to say the least. We don't really get proper cutscenes for a lot of the important information. Instead, we get a text scroll. Oh my god, we get so many text scrolls throughout this game. And a lot of the time, it has this weird, angry Nobunaga in the background. You might have already noticed that the text alignment is a little off. But that's a recurring problem. The game makes use of text boxes to tell its story, and an obnoxious amount of the time, letters will cut slightly past that box. 
We also barely get a character introduction. Our protagonist, Onimaru, just shows up to the Genma invading his village. We're immediately told we have Oni blood, and off we go to kill Nobunaga once more and save the world. And because I would not deny you this fun trivia fact, Onimusha Tactics comes with a manual that had some pretty bad errors in its story. Demon Blood reads the story title. Genma King Nobunaga Oda's attack on Iga has begun. The manual then goes on to tell us that long ago, the Genma demons ruled, but then they were destroyed by Nobunaga. You know, the Genma Lord Nobunaga. But it's okay, because our hero has the blood of the Genma demons, and he, Genma Onimaru, will save the day. He must become Genma Onimusha. I the Genma are the enemy, if that wasn't clear. I don't know who fact checks these manuals, but wow. The manual also tells us we're to be given a demon sword that can consume the soul of Nobunaga. I'm a little sad we didn't actually get one of those. You know, reading the manual intro almost makes it seem like they had a completely different story in mind at first. Especially because the Onimaru art in the manual doesn't have the Oni gauntlet, but he does have the sword. Hmm. Oh, wait, no, never mind. They also call Eke a gunman when he very definitely has a spare. I guess they just messed up. Anyway, in the actual game, we also have a sister who has some interesting quotes, to say the least. Wow, Onimaru, I saw that. You were great. That big brother of mine is some guy. If you weren't my brother, I could really go for you. Hey, bruv, make my armor prettier, will you? He's full of beans, isn't he? The dialogue in this game is either terribly written or terribly translated or both, with strange changes like calling Honoji Temple simply Hono Temple. One of the first things the mighty Genma Lord Nobunaga says in our presence is, Hey, Jaid, this one's all yours. Very intimidating. It probably doesn't help that the game introduces new characters every two seconds. Our first party members are three random villagers, and then Magoichi shows up from the second Onimusha game, Except his character has changed entirely, and he's just weird now. And this goes for most of the characters. There's a cast of five main characters. Onimaru, of course, followed by the four chosen ones. Makuichi, Ageha, Mitsuhide, and Kairomaru. They get some character progression, but not a whole lot. Just enough to move the plot along. Everyone else is just there. Some of them quite literally show up and say, I'm going to join you now, and the team mostly shrugs and says, okay. There's nothing more to it. Eke from the previous game is also here, so is Kotaro, but even they get minimal attention. So you end up with a rather large roster of mostly uninteresting individuals who you'll ignore for the better part of the game, because there is no reason to switch. And having zero attachment to the characters isn't the only reason for that. There is also no point in terms of combat. Onimusha Tactics seems very much like a tactics starter game in that you can't lose. There is no permanent death. If your characters die in battle, then no they didn't. They're actually sleeping and show up just fine for the next round. If you lose the entire battle, no problem. You retain your experience and are simply asked to try again. There's absolutely no repercussion for losing anything. But just in case you want to farm experience, you can do so in the dark realm, which looks extremely bland. I cannot emphasize enough how much I find nothing about this level appealing. And this is a Across the board. The environments in general have a strangely muted color scheme, which in turn makes a lot of the areas, though not all, seem particularly bland. I do like the character and enemy sprites well enough, which makes it a shame that they don't have particularly engaging animations. The magic especially is a little dull, and while we're on the topic of magic, it's not very good in general, making several characters obsolete rather quickly. If you want to cast the most powerful magic in the game, you'll use a good chunk of your mana, with many characters only being able to cast a single spell or two at most before they have to use a mana regeneration item. And most spells are cast in a plus formation, like so. Which means if you want to hit multiple enemies, you'll have to get very lucky with enemies standing on top of each other, and they usually don't. The damage these spells do generally doesn't exceed melee hits either, so the only real advantage they have is that they're ranged. Far more useful instead to add another powerhouse melee character to your squad, because why wouldn't you? They're generally less squishy anyway. And when it comes to leveling your characters, they've neglected to change one rather important parameter. The way leveling works in this game is through simple attacks. If you're level 1 and you attack a level 2 character, you get 48 experience points, the maximum amount. Everyone levels when they gather 100 points. If you're level 2 and attack a level 1 character, you get less points. But they didn't scale that for abilities. Using a buff or heal ability and hitting at least 5 characters with that ability nets you the full points. 
And because there is no drawback to losing a battle, you can enter the Dark Realm, stack up your group, cast a group heal, collect your points, and leave. Any character that has a buff or heal of this kind can level this way, which meant I had a team full of maxed out characters rather quickly when I found out about this. Not that I needed to, because the battles are not difficult with or without a balanced team, even though this tactics game decided that you should simply not be able to decide where your characters are placed at the start of the battle. Nor does it matter which side you attack an enemy from. They also added Issen Criticals that randomly activate and only work if an enemy attacks you regularly, which is almost never. A tactics game, but without tactics. That's what this is. And like I said, I'm not a fan of this game. The music, while each separate track is actually quite good, becomes grating very quickly when you hear it on loop for too long. And the dialogue isn't entertaining, even when they try their very best. I do not enjoy tearing a game down like this, which is why I'll give you the cliff notes on why this game's story likely isn't canon, even taking into account the mess that is the Onimusha canon. So we can move on. Tokichiro is in this game again, but he's called Hideyoshi Hashiba now, the name he would adopt later in life in the real world. Except in this game, he turns into a Genma himself. He becomes Genma Hideyoshi in the final battle. We also kill Nobunaga at Hono Temple, when his eventual death does happen at Honoji Temple in Onimusha 3, and during Mitsuhide's rebellion, which Tactics is already trying to cover. And then there's the fact that both Kotaro and Eke can die in Onimusha 2, and they're definitely here now. And as a minor detail, it's mentioned in the first game game that low-level Genma can't speak, and they absolutely do in tactics. And as a personal pet peeve, the game uses the river Styx at one point, when Japan has a perfectly suitable underworld river of their own, Sanzu no Kawa. Just use that one! The second Onimusha spin-off, Blade Warriors, is an entirely different beast. It's like Super Smash Bros., but with Onimusha characters and Mega Man. This game is fine. It's okay. The voice acting ranges from bored to stale to awkward and stilted, but I imagine the translation from Japanese to English may have been responsible for that, at least in part. Or perhaps it's the fact that each scene they play out only lasts about a minute or less and roughly goes as follows. Hey, hey, kill Nobunaga? Yes. Kill Nobunaga. Farewell. There's a lot of debate on whether or not the story is canon to the rest of the franchise, and in this case the opinions are incredibly split. There are bits and pieces of story hidden in this game, I use hidden loosely because if you want to see it all, you have to play through the story mode several times on several characters. Not a huge ask if you enjoy the game. The main characters of the previous games are available to play and each will give you a small segment from their point of view or from the point of view of someone observing them. In the end, all the heroes fight Nobunaga and all the Genma characters fight Samonosuke or Jubei or sometimes both of them together. The Genma characters are not that interesting story-wise, although you can unlock Juju Dorma's younger version as a playable character and she's very fancy. Mm. I'm here at last. The characters that give you most of the main story are Samonosuke, Kaide, Kotaro, Jubei and Magoichi. And you can only unlock Magoichi by completing 200 versus battles. This is not fun if you're just here for the story, let me tell you. Once you've unlocked everything and everyone, you'll learn that Kaide did find Samonosuke, and that Samonosuke never looked for her because he was afraid he could not control his Onimusha powers. Yumemaru has also grown up and exists. Eventually, the story has Jubei and Samonosuke meet up, and they two-player mode Nobunaga to death. Again, all the other characters don't seem to be canon, or at the very least are inconsequential. I I think the main issue I have with this sort of storytelling is that it makes very arbitrary changes. In Onimusha Warlords, it's said that Kaide never found Samonosuke and she died in battle. Onimusha was planned as a trilogy from the very beginning, so to change such an insignificant detail now for the sake of a beat-em-up seems almost casual. Inafune did insinuate in an interview in Gamer Magazine years ago that Blade Warriors is canon, so he's well aware of the change. I hope. And I think this is very telling of the man himself. I don't think Inafune likes to make cohesive stories as such, I think he wants to write fun stuff. By that I mean, I don't think he wants to get bogged down by details like this. Yes, he established Kaide's fate already, but he thought this would be cool to add, so he did. And then Kaide is dead by the time Onimusha 3 starts, because otherwise he'd have to account for her being there. So instead, she becomes a tragic character that Samonosuke can be a little sad about sometimes. Blade Warriors also includes Gogan Dantes again, and he's already dead, and the fact Jubei and Samonosuke meet but then don't team up to defeat Nobunaga again later is a little weird. The only reference we get in that respect is a mention in the final Onimusha game that 
Samanosuke and Jubei knew each other. I don't have too much to say about Blade Warriors, except that it's serviceable. It's definitely a video game. The combat involves the Genma Onimusha concept of fighting over souls, which usually goes in the NPC's favor if you're fighting a boss at all, especially because an enemy hitting you will interrupt the orb absorption, so if there is even a single enemy left, you're not winning this struggle. New characters are unlocked by playing the game and defeating the new character, much like Super Smash Bros. But unlike Super Smash Bros., there aren't many exciting abilities to use. When I think about Link in Smash, I immediately think of his sword, the hookshot, boomerang, and bombs. Kirby swallows opponents and copies their moves. Pikachu has actual Pokémon moves. Blade Warrior has none of that. Each character has one vaguely specific move, but they're hard to tell apart because none of them look particularly flashy or interesting. Visually, it's just not very fun. You have items at your disposal, and just like in Smash, they're ridiculous. You can spawn magic orbs that turn you immune for a moment and deal massive damage, elemental shields you can throw at people to start a thunder or windstorm, and then you have suddenly useless items like timed bombs that are so easy to dodge it's insulting. What I do like about this game is the leveling system. Not because it's in-depth, but because sometimes you'd be surprised by a level up transforming your character into an entirely different creature, or a new bit of story unlocking. You can also gather items and weapons to equip your characters with that, while not very impactful, do give you a sense of customization. While most of these items are bought by the end of each story game, you can also find some of them secretly hidden in two particular levels, which is fun to run into on your own. Also, did I mention you can unlock Mega Man? you can unlock Mega Man. The controls aren't especially fluid, but once you've played for a while, you get used to it quickly enough. And while most of the assets are reused from the previous two games, they did put in the effort to create new cutscenes, low effort as it is, and the environments look just fine. Except the Dark Realm, that one can sort off, I only did it to unlock Zero from Mega Man. Mega Man! There isn't a great deal more to be said about this game. It's a game. And it has an import function for Onimusha 3 Demon Siege. I am a master of segues. You heard that right. A game that hadn't released yet could have their completed save file data imported into Blade Warriors to unlock Gargant, the most powerful character available. And wouldn't you know it, Gargant was the character that killed Kaide. Bummer. Before you ask, I'm afraid he has no extra cutscenes in Blade Warriors. What he does get is the coolest intro video of any Onimusha game so far, or ever, really. Onimusha 3 released about three months after Blade Warriors in Japan. North America didn't get it until two months after that, and Europe didn't get it until three months after that. A lot of people did not enjoy this game, but I am not one of those people. This game is set around time travel, which is not generally a good idea in any story, because it creates loopholes, but we've already established that Inafune could not possibly care less about those. He will create a Swiss cheese if he thinks it makes for a fun story. We open with Samanosuke's attack on a Genma tank. Inside, he finds Gargant, the terrible Genma general that killed Kaide. We crash the tank, absorb all the Genma souls, turn into the Onimusha, and absolutely destroy Gargant, causing Nobunaga to sense a disturbance in the force. Yes, he was an incredibly short-lived character. The game then switches to future Paris, where we find Jacques, played by the real-life Jean Reno. J'arrive! <laughs> He's talking to his son, Henri, when Genma suddenly attack, and we get a rather graphic cutscene about it. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the past of Japan, Samonosuke arrives at Honoji Temple, where Akechi Mitsuhide's rebellion has finally led to an all-out attack on Nobunaga. We defeat his retainer, the obnoxious little weasel called Mori Ranmaru, but are no match for Nobunaga himself. It's lucky then that a time zone appears to drag us into 2004 Paris, where we manage to save Jacques from a Genma attack. Our Oni gauntlet doesn't work here, and we don't speak French, so instead, the game time zones Jacques and his dying friend to the Japan of the past, only leaving us his phone and an excellent view of the bad guy, Mecha Gildenstern. It's for you. Making our way downtown, walking fast, we find a suitable weapon in a tomb and soon run into Jacques' fiancée, Michelle, 
who doesn't trust us but eventually needs our help, so we punch a boss in the face as the game switches to Jacques once again, who is blessed by the Oni with an Oni gauntlet too, quickly teaming up with the Samonosuke of that time and place, while aided by a Tengu called Akko, who allows him to understand and speak Japanese. And that's it. That's the premise of the game. Akko serves as a link between each of the worlds as she can travel between time and space to deliver messages and items to either Samonosuke or Jacques. At times, the characters will be in the same general place, but at different times, so they have to unlock puzzles together on their way to defeat Nobunaga once again. <laughs> All the while, we keep running into that tedious snake Ramaru. I really hate this guy. He mostly sends bosses after us, but every so often he'll actually fight us, and he fights like a conniving rat. I hate him. Another recurring character is Henri, Jacques' son, who was apparently called Anil in early scripts, and now you can bring that up at Trivia Nights. I... I'm sorry, I hate him too. He's very annoying, although I might be biased because of one particular instance in this game, which includes a Simon Says puzzle that I had to solve with a busted controller layout which made it impossible to do without remapping everything, and yes, maybe I hold a grudge. Dad, do just like I did. Ah! The character growth in this game largely comes from Jacques and his little family. Jacques is initially reluctant to help the Oni at all. He just wants to return to his own time, but gradually he begins to see the point in punching Nobunaga in the face. Henri doesn't like Michel because his mother died in a car crash, which he blames himself for, so he doesn't want a new mother and consistently puts himself in mortal danger because of it. Michelle's arc is that she's upset about that. Thankfully, she is an adult who can accompany Samonosuke with her gun, but the game has to keep Henri relevant and part of the plot, so they give him telepathic powers. Yes, really. He can sense when his father is in trouble in the past, and he knows exactly what he needs. At one point, Jacques finds his bike in Japan, but it doesn't have the keys. Henri telepathically knows this and grabs the keys to hand to Akko, who gives them to Jacques. Okay. Now Dad wants his keys. I'm here to collect keys. I know, here they are. Are you sure he doesn't want his rocket launcher? A what? Uh, never mind. I'm sure Dad will think about the rocket launcher soon enough. The time travel in the story, as usual, mainly serves the gameplay. Switching between characters and solving parallel puzzles is the biggest addition, but since it needed a story reason, here it is. Guildenstern wants to bring Nobunaga to current-day Paris so he can take over the world. What we're looking for at any given time to stop this from happening is a little vague, but we're killing Genma, so something good is happening. Saying that, sometimes things do go a little overboard with the deus ex machina. There's a point in the game where Ranmaru has turned into a Genma and trapped Samanosuke, yelling he'll turn him into a Genma too. After this happens, the game switches to Michelle's point of view, where Henri immediately runs off to find Samanosuke. He runs off so fast, in fact, that this trained army lieutenant simply cannot catch up with him. I guess he's not just telepathic, he is also the Flash. But, Michelle says, if I know Henri, he went to church. Why? When was he established as an avid Notre Dame visitor? Of course this means we have to visit Notre Dame, which is infested with Genma, but we have a gun, so we fight through it until we find a note that mentions Genma experiments happening in the Boulogne Zoo. Michelle now assumes that Henri went to the Boulogne Zoo. What happened to his obsession with churches? Then Akko shows up to tell her Samonosuke has disappeared, leading Michelle to conclude that both Samonosuke and Henri are at the zoo. They are at the zoo, of course, but this is a classic case of the character being correct in their assumptions because the writers wanted them to be right. I'm going to call it script clairvoyance, and I'm going to copyright that term. Why should I believe this? Because apparently it's true. I understand the need to move the plot along, but in this case it was simply done so Samanosuke could in turn see both Michelle and Henri get kidnapped by Guildenstern. Michelle! Henri! <laughs> That way, we could come and save them and finally actually kill Guildenstern, thank god. I've wanted to do that since the first game. But then Script Clairvoyance strikes a second time because there is a poster of Mont Saint Michel in this room and Michel's eyes are immediately drawn to it. This must be the main Genma base. But this time I'm fine with the script granting us speed because it gives us the best scene in this game. The car ride. Thank you. 
this scene makes the whole game worth playing. During this car ride, Akko also uses her super magic powers to channel Henri's dead mother through an old ring so she can tell Henri he looks sad and now Henri is okay. There really is a lot of because script said so in this game, but I still really like the game, partially because it's so silly. A lot of the scenes in this game range from a little over the top to downright bonkers. In order to find Nobunaga, we leave for Mont Saint Michel, which is ruled by a bug lady Genma, with the hots for Nobunaga, but also there's a giant bug Genma under Mont Saint Michel, so when she starts to lose, she activates the bug, who flies into the air, Jacques hookshotting himself towards it with his whip, and eventually falling off from way up high straight into the snow and somehow surviving. A little later, we ice float raft our way across the water to find an Oni gauntlet that lets us summon the Oni spirit army that we let loose on the Genma army at Azuchi Castle. Then we switch to Paris, where we run up the worst stairs in the history of the world, because it's covered in time zones and roly-poly enemies that keep resetting your progress, and our only reward is finding the little shit weasel Ranmaru at the top again, so we can have a boss battle about it. At least we get to kill him here. Mostly. But then we move to Japan again, where we again find that time's Ranmaru, and we get the most satisfying scene in the world that I will now play on loop for a while. When the fun is over, we have to face Nobunaga, who punches Samonosuke's lights out in two seconds, so Jacques has to fight him alone. In classic action hero fashion, we win, but we don't stab him to death thoroughly, so just as Jacques leaves to go back to Paris, Nobunaga gets back up and kills Samonosuke. Yes, really. The Samonosuke of the other timeline is getting ported back too, though, so he literally barges back into Honoji Temple like, also, Ranmaru came back in Paris, kills Henri, gets killed by Jacques, and then Jacques' Oni Gauntlet revives Henri. Anyway, back to the real fight. Samonosuke merges with his corpse, becomes the Onimusha once more, and beats the crap out of Nobunaga, who of course has a second form that we beat the crap out of too. This is by far the easiest final boss fight in the series, as far as I'm concerned. I literally button mashed him to death by just pressing triangle a lot. Once defeated, we absorb Nobunaga into the Oni Gauntlet and walk away. A little underwhelming as trilogy ends go, but at least we finally learn to make sure the enemy is really dead before we leave. The ending scene is Samonosuke and Akko walking off together to find a way to seal Nobunaga away for good. There is also a secret true ending that you unlock by clearing the final stage of the critical training ground. An extremely difficult trial. It absolutely sucks to do this. Cannot recommend. And as a reward, you get a pretty fun item, but the ending is definitely interesting. Akko, you should know, behaves like a child, talks like a child, looks like a child. But in this secret ending, she very clearly has the hots for Samonosuke and even grows to a bigger size to try and please him. Samonosuke pretends not to notice, and oh boy, I am also trying very hard to do that right now. I guess they've got some issues. The final, final credit scene is actually a prelude to a possible Onimusha 4, however. They honestly left the door wide open by having Samonosuke walk off mumbling about sealing away Nobunaga and now Hideyoshi is on the way to take over the world, and there would be a fourth game of course, but it's certainly interesting that they already gave us a cliffhanger with this one while being adamant about their trilogy structure. The game also sports a few minigames and a small extra adventure revolving around Honda Hihachi. You meet Hihachi throughout the game where he's working for the Genma against his will. In his personal adventure, you play as him while defending one of the towns we visited. It doesn't add a great deal, but he's actually very powerful, so at least combat-wise, it's worth checking out. And Samonosuke must have learned something from him because he adopts his abilities in the next game. It's not very long either, and you finally get an explanation for his sudden appearance in a temple later in the game. Hey, Hachi, you... <laughs> Seriously, this scene does not get explained unless you play his adventure. And even when playing the adventure, his incessant laughing is very confusing. Outside of Haihachi, there is a shooting minigame and a zone where you can endlessly do the regular puzzles you find in the game. If you do them wrong, Akko makes fun of you. It's set in the Dark Realm, so it's literal hell. This also means that Onimusha 3 really only has one extra feature over Onimusha 2, the Haihachi story. Which is a little ironic when Inafune mentions in an interview that Onimusha 3 has tons of bonuses, twice what we saw in 2, lots of minigames, lots of extras you can get. 
think he might have overestimated the content a little bit in that regard. And Demon Siege quite lacks the replayability of the second game, which was one of the more vocal points of criticism at the time, the short length of the game. Strange, given the general short length of Onimusha games in general, the game still sold well, but noticeably less well than the previous two, and it's a shame because they tried some new things and really wanted to give the fans a fresh experience. I enjoyed this game very much, despite Henri's presence. You can tell a lot of heart went into making it, and I like the little winks to previous installments, like the museum art in the zoo depicting a bunch of enemies from earlier games. Also this. Seeing Jean Reno's face in the game was also definitely a surprise at the time. Samonosuke is played and motion captured by a famous Japanese actor, Takeshi Kaneshiro. Because of that, the team decided they wanted his counterpart to be played by a famous actor from whatever region opposite Japan they'd put in the game. Either New York or somewhere in Europe. They chose Paris in the end, and so looked for a famous French actor to play Jacques Blanc. You can imagine that might cut into the budget quite a bit. Jean Reno does give it his all, though. It clearly isn't just another job for him. There's some behind-the-scenes footage of him working on the game, and he really wants it to do well. He's actually the one who offered to do his own voiceover lines for the French dub, which I thought was really neat. He's not a professional voice actor, so he's going to sound a little off in places, but it's clear he's put his heart into this, and I always appreciate big names viewing games as a serious medium, especially back then, when gaming wasn't quite as big as it is now. Very cool, Jean Reno. The reason they set part of the game in Europe is specifically because Onimusha 2's sales numbers were weakest in Europe. They figured that it would help to add a European setting to win us over. A terrible idea, because France is not the entirety of Europe, so even if this was important to anyone, it would really only win over France. And quite frankly, I don't know of too many people who would buy a game strictly because it's set in their country. Not that a change in scenery was the only change. They added a whip-type weapon this time around for Jacques. The previous Onimusha games generally used swords and sword-type weapons, with the exception of Onimusha 2's hammer, but it's pretty late game and doesn't change an awful lot. Whereas the whip has its own moveset entirely. You can grab and toss enemies or objects, and during several boss fights you'll be able to whip across the battlefield, which feels very satisfying and makes the boss fights feel so much more engaging. Another mechanic this game added was Akko. Once you obtain her as an ally, she will sometimes find boxes for you that you can open by pressing square. I generally found the boxes before she did, and if I didn't, they were almost impossible to see to begin with. But it was a nice surprise whenever I heard her say, found one in a very Navi-like tone. She did like to bug out at times, flying back and forth between you and the box until you walked into the proper position, which was a problem that Jacques' whip platforming ran into a few times too. Uh, yes, there's platforming in this game, to a point. You don't have to time jumps, don't worry. Jacques can use his whip to jump onto higher stages or safely down. To do so, you have to stand near enough to these glowing insect-like creatures, but especially during the castle section, it would tend to ignore my presence occasionally. They glow faintly when you're close enough, and it's a little hard to see at an angle. Even so, it is a nice addition to an otherwise pretty static way of traversing the game world, literally adding new layers to the stage. Onimusha 3's world also feels a lot bigger in general, not just because you're time traveling and playing two separate characters, but because you actually go places. Onimusha 1 took place in a single castle. Onimusha 2 had you go to a few more areas, but you largely kept around the same two villages when counting Yagyu Village, as well as the first game's castle. It didn't help that the game didn't really see you travel very much, you would just appear places. The closest we get to a travel scene or the passage of time was the travel back to the starting village on horseback. In Onimusha 3, we take a train and a boat and a car! We really go places, and there's quite a few more varied zones available in the first place. It feels a lot more like you're a part of the world and not a magical teleporting isekai character. And although I do miss the pre-rendered backgrounds, these fully polygonal backgrounds do make everything seem more like everything takes place in the same realm of existence. This time around, the game didn't start out on the PlayStation 2 like the first two games, so they could take full advantage of the hardware's capabilities, and I would be remiss not to talk about the CGI opening and saying this.
They put so much effort into this work of art. They invited famous stars to direct and choreograph the entire thing. A true Hollywood blockbuster team worked on this sequence. Robot Communications, the animation studio involved, even won several awards for the entire release. They spent a whole year in production on the intro. It was extremely cool and also extremely expensive, is what I mean. It's one of my favorite CGI openings in game history. And on that note, it's worth mentioning that this game came out on PC too. It was the only Onimusha game to do so. Even Warlords didn't get a PC port until much, much later. And I can see why, because the port is terrible, please don't play it. Because I did, and I regret it. There is no legal way to obtain the PC version anymore either way, so that doesn't help. It used to be available on Steam, but was pulled for various reasons, one of them being the lack of PlayStation controller support and a lack of various graphics, like the fog in Paris. But more importantly, the PC port does not open with the CGI cutscene. It only plays if you wait on the starting screen long enough, otherwise you will never see it. Please, please tell me who made the PC port, I just want to talk. Kick his ass. Alright, so the port is going to have strange graphical glitches. Good. No proper PlayStation controller support? Yes, very nice. Uh, is there anything you'd like to change or add? Hmm. Well, about that award-winning CGI intro that everyone loves. What about it? I, I don't think it's necessary. Let let's just cut it. It can play as a little extra on the starting screen, if you're lucky. That, that seems... Bad? It's an easter egg. We could call it an easter egg, right? You know what? These are a lot of directions. I'll just send the team a short note to make everything worse than the original. Will that do? Yeah, that'll do. Onimusha 3 was meant to be the conclusion to the arc. And it was, to a point. Until they made another Onimusha game that they didn't call Onimusha 4, just Dawn of Dreams. Don't worry, they couldn't resist including Samonosuke anyway, and Jubei, to a point. This would technically be the final entry in the Onimusha series. We follow a man called Soki, also known as Hideyasu, the adopted son of Hideyoshi. He's also known as the Black Oni, and as protagonists go, the only man who can stand against the soon-to-be-resurrected God of Light, Fortimbra. Yeah, he's really upgraded since the first game. I'll be perfectly honest, this game was made quite a bit longer than the third, and it shows in the story. It's rather convoluted. And it doesn't help that you only get your information in small bits and pieces, which leaves you to put it all together. So. Here are the spoilers. Fortinbra, the Genma king of the first game, is locked inside of the Omen Star, a big glowy moon type thing. The goal of the Genma now is to free him from his prison, and in order to do that, they activate the two dark zones to funnel power into Hideyoshi, who is now possessed by the Genma, and holds the seed for the God of Light's rebirth. And eventually, that seed will allow Fortinbra to be reborn, but only if their magical Genma tree has enough little Genma trees. Soki, as the Black Oni, is the opposite team's god and the only one capable of defeating Fortinbra, which he eventually does with the power of friendship. And then he sacrifices himself to destroy all the Genma trees in the land, as well as the Omen Star. The end. That's nonsense! That's the main storyline, but let me be very clear from the start about this. The game has no rules, and neither does the story. I might as well have just said that they have to take the thingamabob to the doodly-doo so they can summon Barabalab. Nothing will ever be explained. There are plot holes everywhere and nothing makes sense, so the sooner we all come to terms with that, the sooner we can enjoy the video game. Soki initially works alongside a single ally. Remember the rope cocoon creatures we met in Onimusha 1 and 3? The ones that take you into the dark realm? The guy runs a shop in our hideout now. Yes, we have a hideout. It even has a cat. Yay! But we can't pet it. Boo! The shop lets you buy and sell items, including weapons you might have missed, and he also appraises gear you found in broken treasure boxes. Yes, I said broken treasure boxes. This entry lets you just step on a puzzle treasure box if you can't be bothered to solve it, but that means you have to pay to get the item appraised. That's okay though. It let me skip these puzzles. I'm terrible at these puzzles. I am so happy they added this. Anyway, the shopkeeper's son or grandson is our sidekick, Minokichi. Together we've been attacking convoys carrying Genma trees. They look like cherry trees, but are actually created out of human corpses. Still screaming in pain, and they produce Genma insects that flutter away to infect humans and turn them into Genma. Soki busies himself burning them, which earns him the nickname Blue Demon, and that in turn attracts our first real combat companion, Akane. 
She's Jubei Yagyu's granddaughter who inherited the Jubei name, which is passed down to the strongest Yagyu warrior each generation. Jubei himself doesn't actually make an appearance in the game, he's only mentioned. Our heroes get off to a rocky start, but eventually start working together, and the game turns into a companion collectathon for a while, as we try to stop Hideyoshi together. Each companion has their own little storyline too, of course. Akane is actually after her uncle, Munenori, a bloodthirsty type siding with the Genma. Both Akane and Munenori have the demon eye, which gives them unnatural powers. Our next companion is Tenkai, whose storyline is that he is Samonosuke. Me again. He's become a warrior monk and wields a pole weapon. Akko even makes an appearance, but now calls herself Arin as a cover. Tenkai then leads us to companion 3, Roberto Frois, a strong Spanish lad whose adoptive father was turned into a Genma puppet and now he seeks vengeance. Our final ally is Ohatsu, Soki's one-time lover who is now herself infected by Genma insects. She's forced to do their bidding until Soki finds a way to cleanse her from their evil, at which point she starts worrying about her sister, Yodo, Hideyoshi's concubine and the mother of his child. The companions bring something of a Metroidvania element to the game. Each of them has an ability that allows you to go places, complete puzzles you couldn't before. Akane can crawl through small gaps, Tenkai can talk to spirits, Roberto is very strong and Ohatsu can use a grappling hook and she carries bombs. The routes they open aren't generally main story related though. Yes, you do need their abilities to progress through the story in general, but the areas that require their expertise also don't open until you already have the character available. Everything else is just a bonus. And yes, that means you have the ability to go back to previously visited areas, which is a concept I've always liked but I do wish they added some story-related unlockables to this process. As it is, you can go back, but you'll mostly find items. Don't get me wrong, those are very useful, but you don't really need anything but the Dark Realm. As you play through the game, Minokichi will eventually let you enter the Dark Realm by talking to him whenever you like. This particular Dark Realm has a lot of levels. Truly, a hundred of them. It's absolutely the best place to gather souls because you can enter, do the first few levels quickly, and then leave to do it again. The item rewards for passing certain levels also reset when you do this. By level 30, you've received a high-level medicine and both a power and drive jewel. Those are the items that increase your health and Oni gauge, and it's incredibly easy to make it that far into the realm. Just like in previous games, as long as your Oni gauge is full, it acts like a second life. So you go into the Dark Realm, grind a bit for some coin, buy out the shop for drive items, and that's it. Congratulations, you can never die. The Dark Realm can get very difficult at the higher levels though, but as long as you have enough drive medicine on your person, it's all very manageable. Especially when you're playing on New Game Plus mode and you have the ability to equip what amounts to a never-ending Oni gear set. You also have regular healing medicine and magic at your disposal, outside of Oni transformations. Once you reach level 50, you gain an incredibly powerful weapon that really breaks the main game quite a bit. But that's the problem, really. This game wanted to be longer, bigger, more or in depth. Inafune had mentioned that the first three Onimusha games were meant to be easy to pick up for anyone because they weren't too complex, but this game had to be different to appeal to the more hardcore crowd. He calls the power-up system very deep compared to previous titles, and he's not entirely wrong there. The original trilogy just had you go into a menu where you saw all your available weapons and armor, and then you'd allocate your souls to any one of them. That's it. Onimusha Dawn of Dreams does the same thing, except now there are more weapons. It's not deeper, it's not more complex, there's just more weapons to upgrade. You might think that makes your choices more meaningful, but not really. Very rarely was I worried about which weapon I should upgrade, given that they're fairly generic. They each have a set of bonus attributes that activate when you upgrade them past a certain point, like extra health, slightly more attack, but none of them are more substantial than direct damage. I looked at the attack power, picked the highest one, and upgraded that. The only important part was making sure they were capable of using magic. Magic in the game does have elements, but for the life of me I couldn't tell you what enemy aligns with what element bar a few of the very obvious ones. So I took my high attack power weapon, I got to Dark Realm level 50, grabbed an amazing weapon, and maxed that one out, because of course I did. 
You can also upgrade your armor here, but it goes all the way up to level 100, and at various intervals it will increase the amount of accessory slots available to that character. Because yes, you have to upgrade each character individually, and you better not neglect that because each and every one of them has their own private boss battle by the end of the game. I honestly feel like the accessories were much deeper than the weapons, because there was an actual choice there, depending on your playstyle or how much risk you were willing to take. Like an item that gradually drains your health, but massively boosts your attack power. There are also items available that provide you with extra stats as long as both characters present are wearing them. For example, there are no less than four different pairs of scarves. The brotherly scarf, the friendship scarf, pear scarf and tau scarf, which you can technically all wear together for stat boosts. Alright, am I ever ready for a fight? What? Just, uh... I wanted to, uh... Can't help but feel something's up. No. No, I just... Wondering about the fashion choice, I guess. You might not like it, but, uh... Don't say it. This is what peak performance looks like. I'm joining Hideyoshi. I'm sure by now you've realized that this makes the upgrade system more of a chore than an interesting side endeavor. Sure, you could argue that if you never do the Dark Realm, you'd be better off actually figuring out which weapon works well against what enemies, but the problem is that it's really not necessary. The game isn't difficult enough to make those choices matter. Even during the final battle, during which I chugged several mana potions and pressed the ultimate critical button that appeared on the screen, which led to the true final battle, that thankfully made the boss immune for a while, so you had to do mechanics, but I still used a bunch of magic again and spammed that to kill the boss to death. I didn't even use my Oni powers. Really, consumables break the game in a big way. Remember when I said that your allies each get their own boss fight by the end of the game? Well, I didn't really prepare them at all. I used Roberto throughout most of the game because I liked his character, but I didn't upgrade their weapons much, nor did I bother getting them new weapons at all. That wasn't really a problem for most of the characters, as long as I found a tactic that worked, but Akane was incredibly squishy, so I threw her a few Oni medicines, activating her Oni mode and easily destroying the boss. Mind you, I'm not saying it isn't fun. I am saying that if you were hoping for a truly in-depth system, this isn't going to deliver that. When it comes to human bosses early game especially, it's very easy to stunlock them. As long as you know their routine and they don't seem to really adjust for your tactics very well, one of the bosses I fought just executes his attacks, whether you're next to him or not. The Dark Realm itself can be both a fun and actually difficult challenge, as well as frustration central. Not necessarily frustrating because of the difficulty, but because there are no save points. You have to do the whole thing in one single go if you want the final reward, which can take upwards of three hours if you get some of the more difficult rooms. When I cleared to level 100 myself, it took a little over two hours, but that was with a maxed out character and Oni gear. At level 100, you fight Gargant once again, and then you get a weapon that I felt was objectively worse than the level 50 weapon. It didn't necessarily feel worth it, and it didn't do anything for the story. And I do mainly play for the story in this case. This game is the longest of the Onimusha entries, and while it's a complete mess for the most part, I really do like the characters. As mentioned, you have a hideout now, and once an ally joins you, you'll find them there, hanging out in silence. They can craft some items for you, but they'll also react to things that happened in the story, and if they're in the mood to do so, they'll give you a little more information on themselves and their storyline. For instance, Roberto seems like a tough guy at first, but he's a softie at heart and even develops a crush on Ohatsu. Soki keeps teasing Akane because she's not acting very ladylike, which leads to some very awkward dialogue between him and Minokichi. Ohatsu is the shy girl who worries for his sister and doesn't quite know how to let Soki know that she's still into him. She finds herself torn between her loyalty to her family and her love for Soki. Tenkai is Samonosuke. Me again. The villains also get plenty of screen time, and there's quite a few of them. Fortinbra is one of them, of course, but he ironically gets the least amount of attention. He uses a manifestation of himself to talk to Soki every so often, appearing before him as a man completely clad in white. He'll say something cryptic and then leave again. He's a little boring. Hideyoshi, on the other hand, gets a weird redemption arc where he bemoans the fact he was trapped in a dream ever since Nobunaga died, implying that this is when his Genma corruption began. But in that case, why was he such a gleefully evil little shit in the previous games? And of course he gets the I'm dying but wait first I have to monologue about it treatment. Joking. 
just die already. Die! No, the main villains are actually a little dull. The villains I like the most in this game are the underlings. There's three of them, collectively known as the Triumvirate. Claudius, Rosenkranz, and Ophelia. Yes, they are references, why do you ask? The big bad villain is called Fortinbra, and we already met Guildenstern and several others, so I don't know what we expected. The Triumvirate each possess a person of note at Hideyoshi's court. Claudius takes Mitsunari, Rosenkranz takes Louise Freus, and Ophelia does not possess but simply turn herself into Yodo, Ohatsu's sister. Every single one of them chews the scenery so hard, I'm surprised their teeth are still in one piece. I love it. Every time they're on screen, I know I'm going to be entertained because they're clearly having fun being evil. They're not tragic. Their backstory is that they're evil and want to eat people, and damn it, they're going to do it. Munenori, another enemy, is threatened with having a sad backstory, but then he turns around to say, actually, I don't care about any of those things. I'm going to kill you now, and it's the best thing ever. His most powerful ability is literally pocket sand, and I can't tell you how much I love that. Pocket sand! Ah! And I really need these villains, because the main thing Dawn of Dreams is missing for me is this strangely serious yet goofy scenes. There's humor in this game, sure, but it never really lands for me. Not like the Onimusha 3 car ride or the Onimusha 2 narrator, the weird metal animals, Gogantantes, or the Cackling Crow, Warlord's opening sequence with Nobunaga's death, or the ending with his silly little stare and Samonosuke's long fatherly rant. Me again. I'm sure none of that was ever meant to be funny, but I found it hilarious. And Dawn of Dreams doesn't have very many moments like this. Perhaps because the graphics are too good now. It's why I liked Roberto so much. He was the stern character that became accidentally funny, even if very rarely. Also, his war cry was, I'll pound you to the end of the world, which, how can you not laugh? Luis! <laughs> the villains fill that void for me to a point, but they could stand to be even goofier. I don't mind, really. Outside of the villains being entertaining little bastards, while the combat wasn't hard, it was definitely flashy. During combat, you can now also start Isen Chains by using level 1 magic, and they are extremely satisfying to behold. It works like this. Weapons will generally have access to Oni magic levels 1 to 3, and to use the higher levels, you have to hold the magic button down. If you don't, you'll only use level 1, but it's the most powerful kind if you're not fighting a single target. Because hitting an enemy with level 1 magic activates the magic Isen. While slightly less powerful than a true Isen, it can chain. Honestly, just look at the footage and you'll understand why this is so cool. I felt like an anime character every time I used it, and it absolutely does destroys Dark Realm waves. It turns the combat into eye candy, but it also means there are several stronger enemies around that you can't use this magic Isen on at all, and compared to other enemy waves, it made things feel weirdly slow. The game in general runs into pacing issues here and there, not just because of the big tanky enemies, but also because it sometimes feels like Inafune wanted a big game, but didn't really know how to make it a big game that was also interesting at all points. The places you visit are not generally as visually interesting as many of the previous games were. The areas that hold the two dark stones are identical, factory-like, brown and grey disasters. And you have to go there twice to do roughly the same puzzle. I use the word puzzle very lightly. There's also one zone in the game that functions like a giant puzzle room. Soki enters the Oni world and there finds himself in the same mansion from Onimusha 3. In Onimusha 3, this zone was blessedly quick. Not so here. You have to run through several side rooms to find find a key to open another room, to find another key, to open another room, to open another key, so you can find a cabinet that tells you what teleportation orb you have to touch so you can get to another zone where you have to run through several side rooms to find a key to open another room to find another... you get the point. All the while, there's enemies everywhere that, again, aren't difficult to deal with, but when you're running around this much, they're a nuisance, so I generally didn't even bother fighting them. I just ran around. That zone didn't add anything truly interesting to the game, it just stretched the gameplay. You can get lucky and click the right teleportation or by accident, which is actually how I did it in New Game Plus, and that speeds things up a whole lot. It only took me about five odd minutes that time. In my first playthrough, it took me about 30 minutes to walk through the entire thing because I did it by the book, and by the end, we're met with Gargant again from Onimusha 3, who, as an Oni who joined the Genma side, was sent to Oni Hell. He is incredibly easy to defeat and much like Munenori, won't stop repeating a single phrase every time we punch him in the face. Speaking 
Speaking of voice acting, I think it's far better than any of the previous entries. Even though Onimusha 3 already did a very solid voice acting job for the most part, I really don't have any complaints this time, which might be another reason why there were a lot less goofy moments in the story to begin with. Although I will say there is some very strange audio distortion going on whenever you have conversations in the hideout, which seems like an important thing to fix. Overall though, I didn't find this game nearly as bad as the internet makes it out to be. It's a very serviceable hack and slash that I enjoyed playing through, but I imagine that most people buying this game back then had expected an Onimusha game not unlike the previous entries, and that's not what they got. And I actually feel that the length of the game worked against it in this case, specifically because it was too slow. Onimusha 3 was said to be too short by a lot of critics, but I'm not sure if the fans really felt the same way at the time. Onimusha games had gradually been getting longer and longer, something the market demanded because nowadays if you don't get at least 200 hours out of your game, apparently you're getting scammed. But Onimusha and hack and slash games of this kind in general were never meant to be very long. You could only stretch the gameplay so much. Onimusha 1 was a game you could finish in just a few hours, and the idea was to then replay it to try and get a better score. This title does not benefit from longer gameplay, it benefits from a tight execution. In trying to please everyone, they pleased no one. They tried their hand at making things almost generic. Despite the very clear Onimusha aspects, it doesn't feel like an Onimusha game. Ever since the first game, they'd started moving away from horror elements altogether, and there really isn't anything left in Dawn of Dreams outside of the trees from the start. There are monsters, sure, but more in a JRPG sense than a horror sense, and they were very clear in that they wanted this game to be seen as separate from the original trilogy. It's why it's called Shin Onimusha Dawn of Dreams in Japan. Shin meaning new in this case. I keep calling the game Onimusha 4, but it didn't call itself that. It was always meant to be something different. However, if that was the case, I honestly feel they'd have been better served dropping the Onimusha name altogether, because as it is, it invited expectations. On top of that, they did use characters from the original series, Tenkai and Arin dropping not-so-subtle hints constantly at their true identities of Samonosuke and Ako, Fortimbra being the grand enemy, Hideyoshi replacing Nobunaga. It was unnecessary. Why did the God of Light have to be Fortinbra? I understand wanting to use Hideyoshi, given the Onimusha series' tendency to build on existing historical events, but Fortinbra isn't real, and we killed him. The game gets in its own way so much that every time they introduce something interesting, they decide to let it overstay its welcome. And it really is a shame because I liked the introduction of combat partners very much. As you go into the world, you can switch between Soki and whoever you're with to use in combat. That way, if you're not a fan of Soki's swordplay, you might enjoy Ohatsu's gun or Tenkai's spear more. Letting each character open specific pathways was implemented well too, because you can switch partners at any save point and there's always one close by, ensuring it doesn't become the Donkey Kong 64 disaster of painful slogs back to grab the correct monkey. Most of the bonus items did not feel rewarding enough, unfortunately, because the Dark Realm existed, and clearing every stage didn't get you much more than that. There's no secret ending for doing the most, no extra character information for crawling through every wall. However, there is one test of valor you can only access by using your allies, and doing every test of valor, small bonus challenges, will unlock a special costume. Two if you do very well in them. Not a massive reward and only usable in future playthroughs, but still. This game does have a New Game Plus mode that's begging to be used. If they'd taken the companion system and really focused on it, I really feel it could have benefited the gameplay itself. Instead of making sure they had big open zones, lots of Dark Realm levels, lots of weapons, lots of everything, I would have personally preferred if they'd stuck to just a few of those things and made them stand out. Especially because you can play Dawn of Dreams with two players. But it's an afterthought, activated through a code, and the second player has no control over the camera in any way. This game had so many fun ideas, but they're lost in a sea of padded gameplay. Having said all that, I think it's also important to note that the Western version of this game is different from the Japanese version. Specifically, they changed the combat balance substantially in the worst ways. Enemy HP, including the bosses, was increased rather significantly, and everything cost more souls to buy. Which, yes, turns the game into far more of a grind than it needs to be. The West was literally playing on hard mode and they never released a version where the balance was fixed. 
Did they think we liked it better this way, I wonder? It feels a little strange to have two versions so different from each other balance-wise, and I do think the added difficulty might have pushed some players away a little. Which is a shame, because I like this game. I've been judging it as an Onimusha game so far, but as a person, I'm a big JRPG fan, and this kind of feels like one. We can level up and spend points in a skill tree that unlocks new moves and power-ups that make each character feel distinct and interesting to play. We grind for weapons, we even fight God by the end, and we get a fake-out final fight! I like how colorful the cast is, I like their personalities, I enjoy the hammy villains, and the combat looks great and for the most part feels great. I'm also a big fan of the soundtrack, which was a lot more Devil May Cry, especially during combat sections, than previous entries. I generally use a lot of Final Fantasy music in my videos because they tend to leave me alone copyright-wise, but I had to use the game's music here. I just genuinely appreciate it. Even better, when you equip the secret Street Fighter costume and start up a new game, Street Fighter music will replace the original introduction level's music, as well as some of the Dark Realm soundtrack. criticisms this game received are valid, especially when you look at the game as Onimusha and Onimusha only. But this was always meant to be something else. The title just means it takes place in the same universe. Everything else got flipped on its head, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I love Warlords, and I love those types of horror-infused titles, but just because this isn't Warlords doesn't mean it's a bad game. Unfortunately, the shocking difference is likely what scared off a lot of the original fanbase, and this game did terribly in sales. They only sold a little over 300,000 copies in Japan, its main market. This was not the actual final Onimusha game ever made, but I kinda wish it was. Shin Onimusha Curtain of Darkness was a Japan-only mobile game based on Dawn of Dreams, but released the year before it. I can't imagine it made waves anywhere, because not only can I not find a playable version anywhere, I can't even find YouTube videos on the thing. Just some screenshots that do not inspire confidence. A second mobile game was made in 2012 called Onimusha Soul, also Japan only, and I want you to imagine Clash of Clans, except with Onimusha characters and card collecting, because that's basically what it is. It was a very short-lived entry, shutting down its servers in 2015, and that would be the end of Onimusha bar a remaster in 2019. I would tell you about the troubled development of the various games that perhaps caused them to become less successful over time, but there isn't any of that that we know of. Onimusha fell off because it didn't adapt fast enough. The games were never perfect, even before Dawn of Dreams. It was easy to poke holes in the plot, and gameplay-wise there was always something they didn't do quite right. But that was the case for most games back then. Gaming itself was still in an early stage. Improvements were happening at a very rapid pace. Not Onimusha, though. That's not too surprising. Something I noticed when looking through the release dates is that they were pumping out these games at a ridiculous pace. The first game in 2001, another in 2002, two spin-offs in 2003, and another big game in 2004 with only then a gap before Dawn of Dreams in 2006. Dawn of Dreams, which finally did something new. I won't pretend to know what Capcom was thinking when they made the series, but I do know that the best games are not made in a single year. The Devil May Cry series saw a year between each title at least. The only other Capcom franchise that pumped out games as quickly as Onimusha was Resident Evil, and even still, a lot of those were side games developed by other studios and teams, with six years between Entry 3 and 4. Want to know who produced all three first Onimusha games? Keiji Inafune. And let me tell you, he was starting to lose sight a little. In an interview at E3 2005, Inafune mentions that the first three games were meant to be easy to pick up for anyone, casual gamers mostly. They weren't very complex, but nowadays, he said, the casual gamer is a dying breed in Japan. There were only semi-hardcore and hardcore gamers left, so they needed to appeal to them with Dawn of Dreams. Because yes, even though he didn't direct it, he also worked on that one. Actually, the casual gaming market was doing really well. In fact, the hyper-casual crowd is one of Japan's biggest gaming demographics right now. I'm not sure why Inafune thought the casual crowd was dying at this point, but needless to say, he was wrong. 
Inafune is just one part of the team, but he is a rather large influence, and given that he doesn't even want to talk about Onimusha at this point, I think we can safely say it's not his favorite child. In an Ask Me Anything Reddit thread he did years ago, he actively avoided answering any Onimusha-related questions, and people brought it up a lot. We just want to see Samonosuke again, man. Me again. Inafune had started moving away from Onimusha, and the series itself was stuck in something of an identity crisis. That's also interestingly showcased by comments made by Shinji Mikami. He mentioned that the idea for Resident Evil 4 actually sprung from Onimusha 3. He said he remembers enjoying the game, but thought it could be better if a few elements were different. Like the camera being behind the player, which is when he came up with RE4's camera system. Laughing, he said that if Onimusha 3 had been better, he likely wouldn't have thought of Resident Evil 4. Given that the first Onimusha was inspired by Resident Evil, that's very poetic. Unfortunately, it also emphasizes the lack of polish in a lot of Onimusha games. Even though I personally very much enjoy every mainline entry, I know they have flaws. And how could they not have, when you have to release a game every year? Onimusha never stood a chance the way it was being developed back then. Between Inafune's constantly shifting ideas and Capcom's tight deadlines, there was no room for innovation. Even when it was clear from the behind-the-scenes footage that the team making these games was extremely passionate about their work, game sales declined quickly and, as of 2019, the entire Onimusha series has sold 8.3 million units worldwide. Five and a half of those come from the first three mainline games, which means Tactics, Blade Warriors and Dawn of Dreams combined have only sold 2.8 million, and that's a generous number because I'm unsure if the remake sales are included. For Capcom, it was no longer worth investing in. They gauged interest with the remaster of Warlords in 2019, but they didn't seem interested in really giving this a fair chance. The Steam remaster is a purely visual upgrade from the original, alongside the ability to use the analog stick. And it does not include Genma Onimusha. Capcom, why didn't you include Genma Onimusha? Why didn't you give those of us who already owned the game a chance to get our hands on that one too? It was an Xbox exclusive, so a good chunk of your PlayStation audience would not have even known about it. This remaster did not do well. Not only did they exclude Genma Onimusha, they made its base price 20 euros. 20 euros for a game from 2001 without any meaningful additions for longtime fans. Not even small bonuses. As a fan, I still picked it up on sale, of course, but I am definitely disappointed they didn't put a little more content into this one. As it stands, Onimusha will not be making a return due to the aforementioned lack of interest. The remaster sold leagues below Capcom's hopes, so the series has been shelved once more, perhaps forever. In an interview, it's mentioned that Capcom hasn't given up on Onimusha yet, but they're not sure how to bring it back in the first place. They simply don't have any inspiration. And really, when you think about it, Neo does a lot of what I'd see a modern Onimusha game do. If not Neo, then Sekiro or Ghosts of Tsushima. The feudal Japan setting has been done by several games now, and they each performed wonderfully. If Onimusha is to come back, then it can't be the Onimusha the fans remember. We can't have another Warlords, because the majority of the gaming audience doesn't want another Warlords. They want something new. One angle that I'd really love to see them take is a return to horror, truly. That's the one thing we haven't seen yet in any of the follow-up games. Onimusha might have been originally based on a Resident Evil game, but it's not Resident Evil. It has echoes of ideas from Resident Evil, and that's about it. There was never any real resource management required, especially in later games where you could grind for extra items. You were never going to choose between running and fighting unless you simply couldn't be bothered to fight. But that's what I'd like to see them try. An Onimusha that is closer to Resident Evil, and yes, that means moving away from the heavy hack-and-slash gameplay, and I know that's perhaps not what most fans want, but it's what I want. I want horror in Japan. The house filled with ninja traps, the idea they set out to put on screen all the way at the beginning, but with the newest gaming technology. Your weapons are limited by the small spaces of the house, Genma ghosts and beasts lurk in its corners. I want to play an Onimusha game and feel like I'm a professional in danger. I want to play a horror Onimusha game again. I enjoyed Dawn of Dreams, but if it was up to me, I just prefer a darker tone. It also feels like the game's stories and settings became more and more needlessly complicated as time went on, and a little simplicity in this case would go a long way. I won't ask them to put the silly moments back in, even though I miss them very much. Me again. Of course, I'm just one person. If they were to make a new Onimusha game, what would you like it to be? 
What would you like to see? Thank you for sticking around for a video this long. I'd apologize, but I won't, because I'm personally a fan of long videos. If you enjoyed your time here, consider leaving a like and a comment so the algorithm doesn't launch this video into the sun. Farewell, until another tale finds us.